John chapter 1, verse 35. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned, and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon, said to him, We have found Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas which is translated a stone. And so as we begin, let me give you a little bit of a reminder, if you will. John had baptized Jesus. And after his baptism, Mark tells us that Jesus had gone into the wilderness. When you look at the uh, gospel accounts of Mark and Matthew, they both say to us that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. And it speaks concerning the fact that after his baptism, he went to the wilderness and there he was tempted by the devil. The devil spoke to him and said things like, make these stones into bread. Or he said, jump from the pinnacle of this temple. And then he finally closed his temptations by saying, worship me. And so Jesus went through these temptations right directly after his baptism. But after his time in the wilderness, John picks up here, the apostle John picks up, that Jesus came to where the, uh, the Baptist was. And once again, John the Baptist makes it clear concerning who Jesus Christ is, because John makes it clear that this is Jesus, he calls him the Lamb of God. Now, as I develop this, let me lay a little bit of a foundation and remind you that... Uh, as a man of God, John the Baptist was careful not to take glory for himself. He was very careful to do that. And I've been mentioning to you that when you serve the Lord, a very most important thing to remember, amongst so many others, is who gets the glory. And John made sure that he was a man known for being a servant. He said, I can't even carry, I can't even bow down, kneel down and, and, and untie his shoes. I'm not worthy to do that. He was extremely humble. And so he's careful to direct the people to Jesus Christ. And he's very careful not to steal glory for himself. I, I, I fear for ministers who forget that. I, I fear for ministers who put their name all over their ministry and want to be associated with it. I, I fear for that. Uh, you may or may not know that even uh, the great evangelist Billy Graham had a real problem with with uh, his name being associated with the evangelism that he performed. He didn't like that. He didn't like the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. That was not something he came up with. That was something that was thrust on him by his board. And he didn't want to be associated as if it would take credit or glory from Christ. And, and that's one of the reasons why I've always admired this man, because he was very careful not to take the credit for himself. Pastor Chuck Smith was the same way. And there are many men of God whom I have come into contact with and have, have met and known who are that way. And that is the mark of a, a true follower of Christ, that you, you want to make sure that people are pointed to Jesus. And that's what he's doing here. That's what John is doing. John knew that he was sent to point people to Jesus Christ, and he was faithful to do that. And what we're seeing here in this passage is John directing two of his own disciples to follow Jesus. These two men that we see are actually becoming the first Christian converts. We need to remember that the Christian church began in a very simple and very basic way. We see it here. Two men came to follow Jesus Christ. Think about that for a moment. Two men, we're looking at this as John is reporting to us, came to follow Jesus Christ. And from these two men who initially were followers of Christ, we have seen over the centuries the hundreds of millions who have been impacted by the gospel and have also come to follow Jesus Christ. 
And so what we're seeing here is two men in the Gospel of John who are the first followers of Christ. Now, verse 40 reveals one of the disciples' name. His name was Andrew. It says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, church tradition holds that the other disciple was John, who's the writer of this gospel. Because when you read these verses, especially at verse 35 and 36, they have what you would call an earmark of an eyewitness. He speaks of how John stood, and he speaks of how he was looking at Jesus and all of that. That's an eyewitness account. And so church tradition holds that the other disciple is John, but we know for a fact that one of the disciples is a man by the name of Andrew. Now again, in verse 36, notice that John says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now he had said that earlier in verse 29. He's once again pointing them to Jesus Christ. And in verse 37, it says, The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. The word followed there is a a Greek word that means to form a permanent relationship. It's a one-time-for-all-time decision. They didn't just walk behind him for a moment that's not what the picture is when he says they followed him he's saying they attached themselves to him they become his disciples it's interesting to note it doesn't say that john told them to follow jesus they simply followed when they heard him say this is the lamb of god remember john came preparing people for christ and these two responded to him and his encouragement really immediately they were adequately prepared for action they heard what he said and they followed they understood his meaning and they acted on what he said so they were prepared to follow christ so john is fulfilling his mission he's pointing people to jesus and people are now following him now as this is taking place verse 38 jesus turned and seeing them following said what do you seek and they said to him rabbi Notice how John is translating for us so that non, uh, non uh, Jew, Jewish people would understand. They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? Now, it's interesting to note that these are the first two words that Jesus speaks recorded in John. These are the first words. The first words he speaks in verse 38 is, what do you seek the second time you see him saying something is verse 39 when he says come and see so the first question we'll look at that for a moment what do you seek what are you looking for how can i be of help to you reveal your heart to me he's asking this because people often seek things for personal satisfaction and fulfillment so it could be when he says what do you seek it Could be, are you looking for security? Are you looking for a career? Are you looking for finances? Are you seeking power? What are you seeking? Are you wanting fame? Do you want position? Are you looking for something that will enable you to live with yourself? Are you seeking for peace? Are you looking for a relationship? Are you looking for love? Are you looking for fulfillment? This is a question that's open-ended. What are you seeking? What is it that you're looking for? You see, they need to understand that what they're seeking for will be satisfied in him. That's a key. People need to know that nothing material will ever satisfy you spiritually. Man's life, Jesus says, does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. The things that we have never satisfy us. Even our family relationships will disappoint us. The material things that we've owned, the things that we've saved for and worked for and and finally are able to buy. And you have that rush if you're able to do that. You wanted that car. You wanted that boat. You wanted whatever it may be. You wanted that. It was something that was a goal for you. Nothing wrong with setting goals. Nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, very good thing to do. But you achieved it. You got it. You finally have it. What did it do for you? My daughter, Corinne, who's... 41 years old now. Boy, she's old. (laughs) When she was a little girl, wanted a doll. I look out here, and some of you will know this one. A lot of you may not. It was a Cabbage Patch doll. I wonder how many remember that. It's in history now. The ugliest doll known to mankind. 
ugly. The word ugly. In the dictionary, when you look up the word ugly, there's a picture of a cabbage patch doll right next to it. Ugly doll. But she wanted this doll. And she worked. My little girl has been a worker since she was a little, little girl. I call her my little girl. My, my 41-year-old baby has been a, a worker bee. We call her worker bee since she was a little, little girl. She was a saver. She still is. The coupon clipper, that's my daughter. That was my baby. And she wanted a cabbage patch. And she saved for a long time, months, maybe a year or more, do a little thing here, get a dollar. Do something here, get a couple dollars. That's what she did. These things were expensive. She, she, I think she wanted twins. The twins, do you remember, Marie? Twi twins. Who in the right mind wants two ugly babies? <laughs> she did. She saved, and it was like $75. That's a lot of money, you know, 30-plus years ago. It, it's a lot of money now for an ugly doll, you know. And she, she saved, and she wanted, and she finally had all her dollars in that, a little pile of, of money, and Marie took her to go buy her Cabbage Patch doll. She worked for it. She earned it. She wanted it. She brought it home. And she hated those, those dolls within like a few days. And she was so upset. She's saying, and she's only a little girl saying, why did I spend my money on these? Why did I do that, right? I mean, she started to learn that lesson as, as, as less than 10 years of age. She started to learn that part of the thrill of achieving something was the saving and meeting a goal. But once you finally had it, it left her empty. And she began to learn that as a little girl. What a great lesson to learn at an early age. My life does not consist in the abundance of the things I possess. You know, if you were, you, you, <laughs> excuse me, if you were to ask me, what is your favorite car? Nobody's asking me, so I'll tell you. <laughs> if, if I had the car that I would like, I'd probably get a 56 Chevy. I like 56 Chevys. Especially when they're a little low, got some fat tires, got some, a big old engine in it, you know, oh. <laughs> but I know that if I had a 56 Chevy, I'd never drive it. I know I wouldn't. Why? Because if I pulled into a, a parking stall and one of these runaway shopping carts would weave its way through the, and hit my car, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> It would ruin my day. So why would I, why will I, and I won't, why would I get something that I am protecting like that all the time? Why? Because I learned a long time ago that those things don't satisfy me, and you only become more and more concerned with protecting them because that's what materialism does to you. It makes you caught up with an inanimate object that you're protecting with all of your life because you don't want damage to take place. And guess what? People are still pursuing that to this day. They're still going after things to their own hurt. They're going after things that they don't need. They're going after things that don't satisfy their deepest inner longings. That's a fact. And I, I don't want to knock things because, frankly, I think that, you know, my wife and I have been blessed by the Lord. We've been able to do many things. But I can tell you, and this is true, I'll say it quickly. Many of you already have learned this. I've learned this, and some are learning this, that the best times I have with my wife is really not related to where we're at in some foreign country doing some ministry. And I've had the blessing by the Lord over the years to see a lot of countries, to travel literally around the world to minister. I've seen some beautiful countries, seen some beautiful things. I, I saw Notre Dame before it burned down. You know, I've seen, you know, you name it, Eiffel Tower, uh, uh, the London, London Bridge. I, I've been around the world. I've seen many things. But there's nothing that satisfies me as much as being home in my den with my wife next to me. There's just nothing that satisfies me like that. So simple things are the blessed things. And to understand that. Now, when it comes to relationship, the most important one is to know Jesus Christ. So when Jesus is turning to these men, he's asking them a question. Open your heart to me. 
What do you seek? What are you looking for? What is it that you want to find? What are you looking for? What kind of relationship are you looking for? They need to understand that they're, they're, what they're seeking will be satisfied by Christ. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. He, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. I satisfy those things. So when he asks the question, uh, what do you seek? Verse 39, uh, well, they answer and say, where are you staying? In verse 39, he says to them, come and see. So they want to know where he's staying. In other words, we don't want this to be a chance encounter. We don't want it to be a simple, quick conversation on a road. We, 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 we want to spend time with you. We want to speak to you. We want to hear your voice. We want to get to know you. And so when they're saying that, when they're saying, where are you staying? Jesus' response, the second word, is come and see. He gives these men what we would call an invitation. It's an invitation, really, to follow him, no longer being blind. What he is saying, literally, is come immediately and you will see. That's what he literally is saying. He's saying you're spiritually blind. But when you come to me, you will see. I'm going to reveal to you things that only I can open up to you. What are you seeking? Well, we, don't, we want to know where you're staying. Come, and you're going to see. You're going to see not just where I'm staying, but you're going to spiritually see what life really is. And so as he's giving them this invitation, it says in verse 39, that they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. The tenth hour translates to four in the afternoon. It's four in the afternoon. Now, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which is translated again, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him. He said, You're Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Rockhead, <laughs> a stone. Well, first, let me develop a couple of things, seeing that we're introducing the Gospel of John through chapter 1. So I'll give you a couple of things that you might want to know. In verse 40, it says, One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. When you read your Bible, you really don't see much information about this man, Andrew. But you do see things, and he is impressive. Uh, one of the things we see about him is right in front of us. John presents him as someone who brings people to Jesus. You see him bringing his own brother to Jesus Christ. When we get to chapter 6 in verses 8 and 9, when there is a, 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 a physical need, there's a need for bread and all, uh, he's the one who's pointing out that there's a boy with five barley loaves and two fish, and you see him working in that. Later on in chapter 12, uh, verses 20 through 22, uh, it speaks concerning his connection with some Greeks who are looking for Jesus. And so what you see in this man's life is, uh, is a man who brings people to Christ. And so evangelism, especially to family and friends, is not only important, but is a natural byproduct of conversion. Evangelism, especially family and friends, is a natural byproduct of you being converted. When you got saved, it is my hope and prayer that you came to understand, one, that you were lost, and two, that everybody you knew and loved was lost too, more than likely. That's what happened to me. That's what happens to a lot of people. That's a natural byproduct. You see, once you were blind, and now you see. Once you were lost, now you're found. Once you were spiritually deaf, and now you can hear. Those things matter. And so when you get saved, you start thinking about those friends of yours who don't know the Lord. And very often, it's your family. When I got saved, I've told the story. I won't, I won't share that much. I just say I got saved. I came home. First thing, I went across the street to tell my friends 
Then I went straight into the house, walked into the den, and shared for the very first time something very simple. I just looked at my parents and sisters, and I said, uh, Madeline, Becky, Mom, Dad, I love you. Praise the Lord. And later on, within 15 seconds, actually, my sisters both had jumped up, followed me where I was going. I shared what happened. And my sister Madeline, that night when she put her head on the pillow to go to sleep, that night gave her heart to Jesus Christ. Because what you do when you're saved is you want to bring other people. When you connect with Christ, what you want to do is tell other people, Jesus Christ saved me. Jesus transformed me. Jesus is the answer. That's what you're seeing take place here. Evangelism is a natural byproduct of conversion. A second thing we know about him is that he's relatively unknown. Even though he was an apostle, he, he is often simply identified as Peter's brother. In, in Matthew 4.18, it says, Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Cast in and in into the sea, they were fishermen. Matthew 10, verse 2, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. Now, people might not know Andrew, but everybody knew his brother. And though he brought Peter to the Lord, his brother's ministry far surpassed his own. We'll see that in a moment. I'll develop that. But you know very little about this man. And so, as he brings him, he brought him, verse 30, 42, he brought him to Jesus. So Jesus looks at him. You can almost picture that. I mean, this is an, just an amazing picture. Jesus looks at him, and he says to him, You're Simon, the son of, so of Jonah. You're going to be called Cephas. Again, which is translated a stone. Imagine that for just a moment. Jesus looking right at him. He's not just looking at his outer appearance. Jesus is looking at him as a man. He's really looking at his heart. The name Simon means to hear. It carries a connotation of not only hearing, but of doing. Your name is Simon. You are known for hearing and doing. The word, <laughs> the word Cephas is translated a stone or a rock. And notice what he says. He says, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. That's interesting when you take note of the fact that there is another Jonah in Scripture. Jonah was known as the reluctant prophet, the one who fled in the opposite direction when he was called to minister to Nineveh. We know the story of Jonah, how that when he was told, go and speak to the Ninevites, these people were the most brutal, evil people, and the Jews hated them. There are, are records of, 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 the, of them taking Jewish prisoners and putting, they put spikes in their lips and put hooks, and with hooks in their mouth, dragged them as prisoners. They were known for, for uh, flaying people, for actually skinning them alive. They would put them on, on sharpened poles and, and torture them. They were the most brutal people, and the Jews hated them. And when God said to Jonah, go and speak to them, no, no. And we see him going down into a boat, and off he goes to try and escape. So we know of a man by the name of Jonah, which is interesting to see that the Spirit inspired John to say, write this down. You are Simon, the son of Jonah. Simon, you're going to be similar to Jonah. You're going to run from your call. But you're also going to come back. Right from the beginning, as Jesus is looking, you got to see this. As Jesus is looking at him, he says, your name is Sina. Uh, as Simon, you're the son of Jonah. Your father's name is Jonah, but there's something more than that. Because Jonah fled his call. Jonah left, but Jonah came back, and God used him in a tremendous way. Even in the call, there's a hint of his desertion in the garden. Even in the call, even as Jonah fled, you will too. 
But God rescued Jonah, and he'll rescue you too. Because we know what happened when Jesus was looking at Simon that night that he was telling him what he was to do. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to obtain you that he may sift you, even as wheat is sifted. But I have prayed for you that your strength fails not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. I will not, I will die for you. Simon, son of Jonah. The way Jonah left, you're going to do the same. But the way God was able to bring him back, that'll happen to you. So even from the introduction, you're seeing a hint of his future. You shall be called Cephas. You who are crumbling, will one day crumble, will actually become a rock. I will completely transform you. You will have a new name. And this new name reveals your new character. And your new name will be emblematic of your new life. For if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation. You see, Simon, you have a name that speaks of hearing and obeying. And you one day will live up to such a name. And you will become a living stone in the church. Again, we know that Peter went through many things that made him into the man of stone. That's because trials often produce strength of character. When they are endured, they produce love for Jesus Christ. And later on, the apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8 said this. He said, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. He could speak as one with experience. He knew what failure was, and he knew what restoration was. And when he wrote his first letter, he said, you are going to be tried, but you will come out purified. And so he's speaking to him, you shall be called Cephas. In verse 43, the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Chino? <laughs> Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. So the day after he speaks to these men, he desires to take a trip up north to a region called Galilee. It's interesting how Andrew and the others had approached him, but now he takes the initiative and he finds Philip. And he says, notice, he says to him, follow me. So he calls Philip as a full-time disciple. He goes to the area called Galilee in northern Israel. He issues this call to him as he arrives in the region. It says in verse 45 that he lived in a place called Bethsaida. That's the house, literally translated, house of fishermen, which is northeast of the Sea of Galilee. Now, there's no explanation of how he knew Philip or how he met him. Notice that. It just shows us that he calls him. It may be that Philip was acquainted with Jesus already. You see... The Bible doesn't give us much information concerning this man, Philip. As it says, he's from Bethsaida. He's a friend of Nathanael's. And we know again that Bethsaida is just north of the Sea of Galilee. We see in John chapter 6 that Jesus will ask him a question concerning how they can feed 5,000 men. And Philip is the one who answers 2,000 denarii would not be enough to feed so many. In John 12, we see in verse 22, the Greeks seeking Jesus came to him. So he took Andrew with him to tell Jesus. And we know also that, that uh, on one occasion when Jesus was speaking in John chapter 14, and I want to read this to you. I think I'll do that. Turn with me to John 14. I want to show you something. That uh, we have another, another encounter with this man. Verses 1 through 9. John 14, verses 1 through 9. And Jesus is speaking here. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, beginning at verse 1. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself, 
that where I am, there you may be also. Where I go, you know, the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you'd known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Now notice verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? What a revealing comment. Lord, we don't know these things. We don't know. He says, have you, have you been so long a time with me, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? This is Philip. We're introduced, and back in chapter 1, we're being introduced to this man, Philip, a man who is used by the Lord. Now, here's something I want to share with you by way of application. When you read your Bible and you begin to look at some of the men who were called to be apostles, uh, there, some of them are extraordinary men. They have extraordinary abilities, and they have extraordinary character. And to this day, there are those whom the Lord has called that are, are, are champions, really. They're, they're, they're people of intellect. They're, they're people of eloquence. They're, they're people who, who are highly educated. They're people with incredible personalities. And, and we, we know of, of these people. We, we admire them. We, we respect them. In many ways, we, we wish we had gifts like that. It would be great if, if I could speak like that. It would be great if I had that strength. I feel that, and perhaps some in this room do too. God has many champions, and they have extraordinary abilities. God has always had champions with great abilities. And, and when you look at Philip, Philip seems to be ordinary. Here's the thing I want to share with you. Jesus has used for faithful, ordinary people because there are far more ordinary people than there are extraordinary people. Need to remember that? There are far more ordinary, average people than these amazing people that sometimes you may see and wish you could be like. And God can use, and I want to say this as a word of encouragement, God can use you as unusable as you may think you are as ordinary as you may be not everybody has the intellect and wisdom and experience of an apostle paul not all of us very few there was really only one but we're all usable we can be used by god why can't we be what what keeps us from from being used. I, I, I was remembering something. Sunday school teacher Edward Kimball. I don't know if you've ever heard. How many of you have heard of Edward Kimball? Some will have. Edward Kimball. Okay. Out of this congregation, three or four hands go up. Edward Kimball. He was a Sunday school teacher. He led a young man to faith. He was a shoe salesman. That young man's name was D.L. Moody. Anybody ever hear of Moody? D.L. Moody, one of the greatest evangelists the United States has ever had. D.L. Moody from Chicago. D.L. Moody went on to become one of the greatest evangelists in his day. Moody went to England. He influenced a man by the name of F.B. Meyer. He's a commentator that many use to this day. F.B. Meyer influenced J. Wilbur Chapman. <coughs> Chapman helped the ministry of converted baseball player Billy Sunday, who impacted Mordecai Ham. How many of you have heard of Mordecai Ham? Raise your hand. Mordecai Ham. He was an evangelist. Mordecai Ham, holding a revival in North Carolina, led Billy Graham to Christ. The man who started it all was a Sunday school teacher, Edward Kimball, who took seriously Christ's commission to be a witness in his world. 
We all know the incredible way God used Billy Graham to reach millions of people worldwide with the gospel. And this person that I took this from says, you and I are not too likely to ever become a D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, or Billy Graham, but every single one of us can be an Edward Kimball and witness for Christ. That's absolutely true. We need to understand that. We need to understand that. Now, in verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So he says, uh, to, Jesus had said to Philip, follow me. But now notice, Philip says, we have found him. So he's including himself in a group of people who have trusted in the Lord. Now, when you become a Christian, you become part of a family, a family of believers. And, and that knowledge really spoke to me when I was first saved, that I actually became part of a huge family of Christians. And that's what's happening. You become part of a family. And notice in verse 45, it says, We found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. So he's not simply feeling that Jesus is Messiah. He is combining what he's experiencing with Scripture. And he speaks of the law. When you read in the, in the New Testament, the law, <laughs> the law is the first five books of Moses. And in the law, the first five books of Moses, you see Moses speaking of the seed of the woman that will break the serpent's head. You see the seed of Abraham in whom all nations shall be blessed. When he speaks of the prophets, well, the prophets wrote of the birth of Messiah to a virgin. It's, they, they wrote concerning the place of his birth, Bethlehem, of his sufferings and glory that would follow. They wrote concerning his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, his being seated at the right hand of God, and of many things relating to his person, office, and work. So he says, this is one who fulfills Scripture. We just don't think he is. We don't feel that he is. He's fulfilling what Scripture says concerning Messiah. And so that's what he's doing. He's presenting Jesus as the one fulfilling what Moses and the prophets were speaking about. And so as he's saying this, he says, and Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. Why would he say that? I mean, why? Well, Nazareth apparently had a poor reputation. And there was some disdain that came out of Nathaniel. Part of the reason may be because Nazareth was a small town. Uh, commentators say that it may have had 50 houses. Uh, when you read concerning Nazareth and all, we do see something of the people in how they treated Jesus later on. Mark tells us in chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, that he could do no miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And Jesus went around teaching from village to village. And so these are people that were so, so in unbelief that uh, they wouldn't even listen to him when he spoke. Isn't this Joseph's son, Jesus? Isn't he just a carpenter's son? Who is this guy, and what's he think he's doing? And so they were rejectors, and Jesus marvels. You see Jesus marveling twice in Scripture. Once he marveled at the, at the faith of a centurion, and the other time it says and he marveled at unbelief, and he marveled at the unbelief of these people in that city. In Luke chapter 4, verse 29, it, it speaks there that the people in the synagogue rose up and thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill in which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. And so can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, the response in verse 46, Philip says, well, come and see. Philip couldn't change Nathaniel's mind, so he invites him. Check it out. He knew that if Nathaniel saw Jesus for himself, that Jesus would be enough for him. It's like what it says in Psalm 34, verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man who trusts in him. And so he says, come and see. Verse 47, so Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Wow. Jesus surprises him. When he says this man is no deceit, no guile, he's saying here is a pure, true son of Israel, not just in name, but in heart. This is a man with uprightness. This is a man with integrity. This man is free of hypocrisy. And this man is candid. 
He not only is a descendant of Abraham, but he's like Abraham. And so when he says that, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit, he's complimenting him. So Nathaniel in verse 48 says, how do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, oh, I got you confused with somebody else. No, he didn't. He said, before, before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Hmm. Jesus reveals supernatural knowledge. He speaks of Philip. He speaks of what he was doing, what Nathaniel was doing. When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, how come that's significant? Because Nathaniel's going to respond, Rabbi, verse 49, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. Why would he say that to what Jesus just said? Well, the fig tree is often the place of meditation and prayer. Jewish people saw fig trees as symbols of their homes and security. In Micah, in chapter 4, verse 4, God said each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid for the mouth of the Lord of hosts is spoken. So it's, it's a symbol of their home, the security that they have. And so he's saying, when I saw you under the fig tree, it was a place of meditation and security. So Nathaniel may have been eating under that tree, spending time with family, spending time with friends. He may have been simply under the shade relaxing, but it's more than likely that he had been praying. And this shows you something because he's not on some street corner to be seen by men. He's doing this in private because in the integrity of his heart, he was making his petitions known to God and he was praying privately and he was seen by Jesus. That is why he'd say, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel because he didn't see Jesus. Jesus saw him and knew what he was doing. He was seen by the Lord. You know, this kind of experience, by the way, I'll say this quickly, where your heart is revealed, things you were doing have been revealed. It happens often. It happens to this day. Some of you have had this kind of experience. You may be in a church service, and God's word is being divided and presented, and it feels like you, because I've had this experience. I'm sure many of you have, too. You feel like you're the only person in the room at that moment. Something about you is being said, something that you didn't think anybody else knew. And just through the illustration or through the scripture, your heart is revealed. And you say, oh, <laughs> you know, have you been reading my, my emails? Have you, how do you, did you overhear? How do you know? And that's how the Lord works. You know, when the word of God is rightly divided and the power of the Holy Spirit is present, he reveals the hearts and minds of people. He does it all the time. He still does it. That's how you got saved. Your life was revealed to you through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You heard a Bible study, and the Spirit of God used that Bible study to reveal to you. That's how I was saved, how lonely and miserable you are, and the things you were going through, and the guilt that you were feeling. Sometimes through the illustrations, it may be so spot on that you think that somebody indeed did say something to the preacher, you know, because he may say something about your drug problem, or your violence, or your, your promiscuity, or, or whatever, something that you thought was hidden really well, but in fact, it's being revealed. And you're not a believer, and you hear that, and you say, my God, this guy knows who I am. And it's not that that guy knows who you are. Of course, Christ knows who you are. And so Jesus is saying, you know, when Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. And that was all it took. You are the son of God. You're the king of Israel. You heard what I was saying. He may have even just been thinking his prayers, whatever it may be. You know, though I was in private, you saw me. Psalm 44, 21. He knows the secrets of the heart. So, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You're the king. As a true Israelite, he recognizes that Jesus is the true king. He's Messiah. Whatever the prayer of his heart would have been, Jesus answered it. And so as he says that, verse 50, Jesus answers and says to him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? <laughs> You'll see greater things than these. He said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You think because I knew where you were and what you were doing that that's, that you haven't seen anything yet. Fasten your seatbelt. We're going on a ride. Interesting, you might want to note this, that uh, he's the first person in the gospel to be said to believe in Jesus. 
He says, you've been impressed by my knowledge of you. <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to see heaven open up and the angels of God ascending and descending. That reminds us of something that happened in the Old Testament. It, it, it relates to Jacob's ladder. And there was a dream. It's recorded in Genesis 28, 12, and 13, where it says, uh, Jacob dreamed, behold, a ladder was set up on earth. Its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I connect heaven and earth. I am the one who connects it. It is only through me that people will ever enter into heaven. He said, you're going to see this, and you're going to see this in my ministry. Jesus Christ is the one who connects heaven with earth. We celebrated Easter just this Sunday. As believers, we understand that there's only one way, only one truth, and only one life, and that's Jesus Christ. And we, and we, and we, and we celebrate that, right? And so what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is saying here, you have to see it for what it is. It is an incredible statement, statement in that he's saying, I am that one who connects heaven with you. I'm that one. Jesus didn't say, I am one of many, or I am one for this period of time. Moses connects the Jews. Muhammad connects the um, Arabs. He didn't say that. He said, I am the one. I am the one who connects heaven and earth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Buddha doesn't do that. Muhammad doesn't do that. The only one who did that is Jesus Christ. And that's what he's saying. And that is a fantastic thing. And that's why C.S. Lewis said either he's a liar or a lunatic or he's the Lord. Those are our choices. A liar, a lunatic. For the things he said, he just said, I connect heaven with earth. What if I walked up and said, oh, by the way, guys, I had something to share with you. It'd just take a minute. I connect heaven and earth. And then I'd watch you all walking out the door saying, oh, boy, he's gone too far this time. <laughs> Why would you do that? Because quite obviously this man's, there's something wrong with him. But Jesus, straight face, looks into his face and says, I'm Jacob's ladder. I connect the heaven and the earth. I am God in human flesh. I have made it possible for God to reach men and for men to have a relationship with God. And you think that what I've said up to this point is fantastic? There's plenty to be seen later on. And you're going to see what God can do when God walks amongst men. And that's what we'll be seeing as we go through the Gospel of John.